Hello, everyone. Welcome to our final session of the INSEAD SDG Week. I'm very honored to be here today, closing an amazing series of events organized by the Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society and various INSEAD student clubs. So let's start. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Viviane Lazar Sobral. I'm an INSEAD MBA student and the co-president of the Latin Club. I started my career in brand marketing for consumer goods and healthcare, and I came to INSEAD to explore a long time uh, interest to make business a force for good. My passion for this topic started was when I was in university, a period during which I first met tonight's speaker because we were both part of the Social Entrepreneurship Club. Without further ado, I want to invite our fantastic guest to share his entrepreneurial journey with us tonight. He was nominated by Forbes as one of the most promising young adults. Oh, he was nominated by Forbes as one of the most promising young adults in Brazil on the 30 under 30 list, recognized as the social entrepreneur of the year under the age of 35, global influential leader by AACSB, and a standing member at the National Youth Council. Recently, he was recognized as one of the 17 United Nations Young Leaders for the SDGs. Welcome, Half. We are very excited to have you here. Thank you, Vivi, for the, the invitation and all the INSEAD group that's hosting this webinar. Also, I would like to invite Olivia Ozino Caligaris. She's a representative of the INSEAD Masters in Management <coughs> program, and she will be part of our conversation later on. Thank you. Hi. So start, um, so how, let's start, uh, please. Okay, the, so this, yeah. I'll give a quick presentation about my work. Sorry if I make some English mistakes, I'm Brazilian. And, uh, and then I'll pass a video, then we have the Q&A. So I quite kindly ask that you can make the Q&A questions in the Q&A box so we can have a fruitful chat later. So my name is Ralph Twains, I run Twice, two organizations in Brazil, which is Renovacio and Verben. And actually, my, my main goal and my main is to change the healthcare system in our country and even globally. So, in the world today, 680 million people need to wear eyeglasses and cannot afford them. So, imagine that 10% of the population needs to wear something that simple, that's a pair of eyeglasses, and needs to use it to see. And cannot, and cannot do it because she doesn't have money to pay this product. And I usually ask people when I'm in the, making a lecture or making a speech, if you wear eyeglasses to take it out, but if you don't, I will help you. This is a cow when you have five degrees of myopia. And this is the same cow without the five degrees of myopia. So imagine that 10% uh, of the population sees the word blurred because doesn't have money. So this is quite a bizarre situation and we are trying to solve this problem. So this is Salik. Salik lives in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is one of the three poorest countries in the world, depending on the ranking that you pick, is the first, the second or the third. And in Burkina Faso, you have, uh, you plant, you have there for six months, have two months that you harvest and you have food and have four months, uh, six, eight, four months, that you actually don't have more food in this uh, village outside the capital, which is Ouagadougou. <coughs> so Salik, he gave him, him his first pair of eyeglasses and he was started to cry because he was able to see again. And when we come back the following day, because we, we liked his story, he was not wearing his eyeglasses. So we asked, why? And I only wear the eyeglasses to harvest. Why? Because if the eyeglasses is most productive so he can get more food, and have less hunger. Salik lost four kids because of hunger. So imagine that like a simple pair of eyeglasses can mean for him more food on his plate. So, and a German guy called Martin Alfmuth developed a technology that can produce high quality eyeglasses with three simple materials uh, and it's a very cheap solution. So with a spring steel wire, with a very flexible wire, you bend, Band in a machine that doesn't use electricity and actually a plastic that's hypoallergic. You can produce an eyeglasses on spot. This is the 
on door glass, which is very, very flexible, very resistant, and I can produce on spot. I can feel I mean, quicker in my camera. A pair of glasses anywhere in the world without using electricity. And like other countries, it's make the refraction a more uh, rustic way. But this technology was uh, sent to all over the world, actually to some countries in the world. It had reached 300,000 people when we, be, we, be, when be, we begin this, uh, when Martin developed this technology six years ago. And we represent this technology and we implemented actually a, a complete health care system in Brazil. So coming back from Burkina Faso to Brazil and to tell about how this connected with my story, I studied with Vivi, uh, Viviane in Inspir, which is a great business school in the country, the best business school in Brazil. And also I did law school in a other school and I didn't have money to pay my studies. So I received scholarships from my school, from a lot of foundations. I had, I made entrepreneurial activities. So I built an uh, advertising agents so I can pay my studies. And I was able to graduate. I made three bachelors at the same time, which was quite crazy, but I graduated in law, business uh, management and economics at the same time. So I, make a joke that my mom watched 14 hours of graduation or you know, bachelor ceremony when I to get my three diplomas. And it was during the school that I met Martin and this reality I won a prize and I went to Mexico in a social entrepreneur uh, activity what is a social organization called Enactus. And I was able to go to this World Cup of social projects in, inside the university. And I met Martin and his technology and when he said these numbers of almost 680 million people that need eyeglasses and cannot use, this actually shocked me. And I said, but there, there are there a lack of eyeglasses in Brazil? Because everyone that I look around that needs eyeglasses, technically, they, I, I think they use it. And I, was, I came back to Brazil to study the problem. And then we, just, we saw very amazing, not so good, but like impressive data. So today in Brazil, 42 million people from our 220 million population need eyeglasses and still don't know. And 27.5 million of these people are in the work, workforce. So, and the cost of uh, income of a person that needs eyeglasses and don't, don't use in developing countries is around $768 in this study. So the cost of the people not wearing glasses in Brazil in the workforce is $21 billion per year. And this is the case of Susana. So Dana lives in a community which is six hours from boat from Manacapuru, which is two hours from boat from Manaus, which is the capital of the Amazonas region. So now you more or less may know where is it. So the, her closest hospital is seven hours in distance. And Susana has 15 children, 50, uh, 15 children, 56 grandchildren, and some great grandchildren. And she never, never had the opportunity to see a doctor. You cannot imagine a night doctor. It's important to know this. So uh, different in reality. In Brazil, we are not allowed to have optometrists. So only eye doctors, which makes uh, med school, can make refraction. So can provide eyeglasses. And she never went to a doctor. So with 76 years old, she had her first pair of eyeglasses. And we have a, a video of her sewing uh, for the first time after 15 years. So she cannot make the sue to help her family, the income of her family, because she couldn't see. And the, the 22.9% of the school dropout rate in Brazil is due to lack of eyeglasses. So imagine you have the best school for kids in the, in the world, the best teachers, but if the kids doesn't see, he can, uh, she won't learn at, at all. So, and this was the case of Thalia, which has six degrees of myopia, she had dreamed to be a doctor, even if the hospital of, was the, the closest hospital to her was seven hours by boat. And we gave her her first pair of eyeglasses. And to make it worse, I said, we don't have optometrists in Brazil. So only doctors can make the, the glasses, the refraction. And 71% of our cities doesn't have any eye doctor. So it's quite a difficult situation for the healthcare in the country. So we developed a system that works with buses. This bus has two clinics inside, trucks, 
and uh, a mobile clinic that go inside the bag that will travel all over the country, providing the full eye care and, and the, uh, the giving of the eyeglasses to the population. So this is Renovat. Renovat is an NGO, is a philanthropic uh, system, and we also have a social business that I'll talk a bit later. So to show what's the impact of this, I, I pick up three uh, examples. So last year we went uh, to Jaguariuna, which is a city in Brazil near São Paulo, 200 kilometers from São Paulo. And in 14 days, we, we entered with our bus to all the 14 schools in the city. We screened all the 3,200 kids. We made uh, full eye exams with all of them that, were, that needed the, the glasses and provided eye glasses for 329. So uh, in, in 14 days, we solved the problem of the lack of eyeglasses in the public school system, public education system in the city. This is the same that we did in, in Spirit Santos, another state. We already reached 11,000 kids in this state only. Also, we make today the biggest uh, eye care system. We can screen today more than 2,000 people uh, in a single day in a very efficient and modular uh, procedure that we developed in-house. So all our system is, is based on process that we can make a system that 2,000 people enter in the morning and they go out with eyeglasses uh, after some hours. So it's very efficient and very uh, systematic way to provide eye care, much more cheap than our public health system. And we also have the Amazonas. I always say that like Amazonas is the second state that we have most helped people. And, until, and we also went abroad. So in the last two years, went to Haiti, which is one of the most vulnerable places that I've ever been. And we saw that kids there, we went to seven orphanages, and as we saw kids actually uh, eating sand soup, uh, rock soup, which, really, which was really bizarre. Went to India this year, just before the pandemic. We went to Mozambique twice last year, one that was an invitation from Pope Franciscus. So we went during his mission to, uh, to help the people of the, the country that was reached by the a cyclone last year. It was a very impressive experience. The Pope went to our activities. It was very interesting. And we, we, we did what is today the, mo the biggest uh, eye, care system, the eye care outreach in the world. So in eight days, we were able to screen and make eye exams to more than 5,000 people. So this be they become a scientific paper that help that our system today is the most efficient eye care system uh, in scale in the world. So and, uh, since six years ago, we already uh, have impacted 150,000 people only in Brazil. We made 65,000 eye exams and donated almost 60,000 60, eye glasses. And the most important, with no public funds. So we were all the funds were private. So we were private funding by 84% by companies in Brazil and 16% by individuals and, uh, and families. So we have uh, several companies that support our work in Brazil. So you may know some of them. Luxitani is uh, something there. The Sky is a AT, AT foundation. So some of them are global. And uh, you have Bank of America that help us to take high care for the most distant places in the country. So because of that, as Vivian said, I already I received some several awards. And then we decided, and this is not in the presentation, to make a social business. So today, when uh, we have the impeachment of our president Dilma two years ago, our funds from philanthropic side collapsed 80% in the period of three months. And then we decided that we could not only depend on the economic cycles because during a uh, depression, the funds for philanthropic funds, they actually got shrinked. And then we develop a business. So today we have Urban also. Urban is a chain of optical shops that we sell eyeglasses, 30% cheaper than the current market in Brazil. And for every eyeglass that we sell, we donate up to 14 eyeglasses. So we have shops in some regions of Brazil already today. And we are also now going back to the full eye care system. So we are implementing AI for screening in scale. So we, we can think the, the solution for the healthcare is to introduce technology and social entrepreneur to change this reality in Brazil. Uh, I will pass a video so we can, it's a two years old video, so the numbers are not up to date. It, it was a video that was produced when I won the social entrepreneur of the year. 
in Brazil from Schwab Foundation. Uh, but this shows the reality of the Amazonas because it's something that most people in the world doesn't know, but it's a very different scenario. So it's a five minutes video and then we can go for the Q&A questions. A gente hoje tem 42 milhões e meio de brasileiros que precisam de óculos e não sabem que precisam ainda. Meu nome é Ralph Toens, eu tenho 25 anos e eu consegui fazer três faculdades ao mesmo tempo. Eu pude estudar de fato porque muita gente me ajudou. E eu juntei com um grupo de amigos e a gente falou, olha, eu quero retribuir um pouco para a sociedade tudo isso que eu recebi, né? E foi aí que eu ganhei um prêmio da Unilever, que eu fui para o Mundial de Nats no México em 2013. E lá eu conheci uma, uma realidade que, de fato, impactou muito a minha vida. O um grupo de alunos da Alemanha apresentou um projeto e falava que 680 milhões de pessoas no mundo precisavam de um par de óculos e não podiam pagar. Eu em supermercado e fazer compra, eu não, eu não tinha mais como ver o preço da mercadoria, ver as validades das mercadorias. Eu gosto muito de ajudar, de trabalhar, né? E aí, à noite, eu costurava. O tempo meu era à noite, eu aproveitava até 11 horas da noite e aí fui... Acabando a vista, né? Quando eu enxergava longe, ficava muito ruim. Eu tinha que fechar um olho para enxergar. É um instrumento básico que muitas pessoas no Brasil, infelizmente, não têm acesso. Tem gente que tem medo, tem gente que tem vergonha de pisar numa ótica normal de mercado. E foi nessa junção que a Renovate surgia para, de fato, mudar a realidade de visão do Brasil, né? E aí, um alemão, que foi o Martin Alfmuth, inventou uma máquina que ele conseguia produzir um óculos de grau de baixo custo. A gente começou a negociação para trazer essa máquina para o Brasil. E, em maio de 2014, a gente começou a dar oportunidade de trabalho para pessoas em vulnerabilidade na produção de um óculos de grau de baixo custo. E aí, a gente ficou um outro problema. Não adiantava nada eu ter um óculos se eu não tinha um outro lado da moeda, que é o oftalmologista. A gente tem muita dificuldade de vislumbrar o que, que é nunca ter tido essa oportunidade. A gente que vive num ambiente mais urbano, muita gente tem óculos, tem acesso a óculos, uma comunidade rural nunca apareceu um oftalmologista lá, não tem ninguém com óculos. O médico vem por aqui é, por ano, né? Não existe médico. O médico que vem assim, né? Em vista não vem, né? Não, existe. não existe. A maioria dos pacientes que a gente atende nunca foi no oftalmologista. Então, a gente precisava levar a solução completa a de saúde visual. A gente conseguiu montar uma unidade móvel oftalmológica, que é um ônibus com dois consultórios. Depois, a gente conseguiu evoluir também para consultórios que a gente cabe hoje dentro de uma mala, que a gente consegue viajar para o Brasil inteiro e, de fato, levar a solução de exame e o óculos de grau. O modelo que eles estão utilizando no Renovatio é realmente uma resolução definitiva do problema através de uma tecnologia de formas de uma operação que seja viável para isso com baixo custo para o beneficiário e capacidade de expansão e multiplicação. E a gente colocou uma meta que a gente quer impactar um milhão de pessoas até 2021. E a gente começou a pensar como que a gente faz isso, né? O modelo atual de pegar dinheiro de empresa e doar óculos ele é praticamente inviável. Então, a gente viu que, de fato, a gente podia trazer uma solução de acesso. Ter um negócio social, aproveitar e democratizar o acesso à visão no país. E para isso surge a Verbem. E a Verbem passou a dar acesso a um óculos de baixo custo. Principalmente em lugares onde já tem o um médico, a pessoa consegue ou no meio público, ou com clínicas populares, ou de alguma maneira, conseguir uma consulta. E hoje tem produto a partir de R$ 39, reais, a armação mais lente do nosso portfólio. A minha economia, no caso, que nem eu estou desempregado, um óculos dele ia é sair R$ 400, R$ 500. Reais. Então, para quem está numa situação do emprego ajuda bastante, né? A gente percebeu que o uso do óculos ele estava diretamente ligado uh, na dificuldade que muitas crianças têm de não ir bem na escola, um desempenho ruim escolar. Se a gente consegue, num baixo custo, oferecer um óculos de boa qualidade, a gente vai conseguir alcançar um número muito maior de crianças. Todo óculos que a gente vende, na ver bem, a gente consegue doar um óculos. Então, a atuação do Renovate continua independente, ela agora é suportada e apoiada para ver bem, mas também continua com outros parceiros para tentar chegar realmente onde de fato precisa a gente causa um impacto e consiga mudar a vida das pessoas. Pensa bem, assim como eu, a minha família e muitas famílias que tem aqui, que não tem acesso à cidade, não tem como ter acesso ao médico, eles com certeza ficarão felizes. Quando eu coloquei o óculos, eu enxerguei melhor, aí eu fui costurada de noite, né? Eu vi muitas uh, crianças, muitas pais chorar só porque ele ganhou esse óculos. A gente já entregou 15 mil óculos em 16 estados no Brasil. Mas muito mais que um óculos, são as pessoas que passam a enxergar com esse produto. Por exemplo, o seu José, José é um ribeirinho paraense, e ele tinha 42 anos, 6 graus de miopia e nunca usou óculos. E quando ele botou o óculos a primeira vez, ele começou a chorar. Ele chorava, chorava, chorava e falava, eu não preciso mais subir, 
Eu não preciso mais subir. A gente subia onde, né? Resumo da história, ele precisava sair. O açaizeiro tem 10 metros de altura. Ele tinha que escalar, o açaizeiro chegava lá em cima. Ah, tá ruim, não tá, tá bom, não tá, tem fruto, não tem. E descia sem nada. E agora ele, de fato, olhava e pode saber se ele precisa ou não subir. Então, quando a gente pensa no futuro, que a gente quer viver, eu quero ver uma sociedade onde crianças não precisam mais abandonar a escola porque elas não enxergam. Onde pessoas não precisam deixar de trabalhar porque elas não enxergam. Ou, como já viu, pessoas têm que perder sua fé ou deixar de costurar porque elas não conseguem ver de perto. Então, é essa sociedade que a gente quer viver. So, this is a bit of our work. So, I think we can uh, go for the Q&A and the questions and try to answer anything that you have. Thank you very much, Half. That was a, an amazing video. Thank you for sharing your story. And we are very excited to know all the behind the scenes of how you managed to make all this impact. So my first question for you is, let's try to understand what were the major steps for you to achieve your current business success? Actually, I, we started Renovash as a school student, as a volunteer. And we all, in the beginning, we were all very mediatic. So we were able to raise a very good amount of capital for the philanthropic side. So beginning with, so we, we, we were very successful as a student to raise money and to go to scale very quickly. So today we are the biggest uh, non-profit organization that I care in Brazil without any money from the government side. So we have a very strong partner groups. And then we develop the business just to, uh, because like we, we don't want to be part of the economic cycles. And today Verben is raising a Series A. We are finishing now uh, $10 million. So it's a very uh, great amount of uh, investment. From our so is our third round of investments, so we are, we actually reached the model. So we have a we have the the shops, the optical shop, and now we are going to the full eye care system. We, we implemented the AI technology in the process. So today we develop a model that's much more efficient than anything that we have in the in the healthcare system in the in the country. So we target the the most poor with a very efficient solution that's cheap, or in the case of Renovasho, free but it can be self-sustainable. So this is how, because of we find a efficient model and we are always focused on the efficiency, cost side, operational process, we were able to scale very quickly. Perfect, uh, super interesting. And here we are in the business school of the world and we see that you made a great impact in Brazil, Haiti, Mozambique, India. So, uh, how was the process to this international expansion? And what are the main differences you see in healthcare, eye care, or in terms also of operations and context in those different markets? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, One Dollar Glass is a non-profit organization is in eight countries today. Uh, we had, as Renovacio, implemented uh, outreaches from Brazil to Mozambique, Haiti, and India. And actually, normally people invited us to go because we have a very efficient process. So when we went to Haiti, we went with another organization in the country, which was a very big university that were taking students there, uh, med students. So we, we went to the eye care system. And uh, when they compare Brazil to Haiti, to uh, Africa, or even to India, we see that the, the health system in Brazil is very good. Uh, it's not a perfect one, but to have a public health system that's free for all. Uh, so we have the, our uh, public health system, which is quite okay. Uh, you have queues, you, ha you have waiting lines, but it's free for everyone by a constitution system. And you go to Haiti, you, don't, you have a coll completely collapsed health system. If it actually doesn't exist. You go to Mozambique, it's the same. India also is very, very complicated to have some solutions, but when we go to other countries that's more poor than Brazil or less developed, we see that the problem is even worse than we face in our country. So this is a main comparison. I think we, we, are, we have a very big problem in Brazil, but we are developing a solution with a uh, high scale screening. This is why we are building a business now that is, uh, this is, we will help a lot of Brazil, but something that can scale globally. This is why our investors are seeing uh, our solution. And this, I think, uh, I can also add because like this connects to the question of Florence in the Q&A 
uh, session asking how we monetize our solution and make a business with our own funds. So we have today two organizations. So we have Renovacio. I can, I think I can add the question. Uh, we have Renovacio. So Renovacio is a non-profit organization, fully philanthropic. So we receive donation from big companies, families, individuals that help us provide free eye care around the country and even outside Brazil. So we go to the places that even a social business wouldn't go itself because it's not economical sustainable. So it's not possible to me as a business, even a, a cheap business, to go inside Amazon because the logistics are very complicated. All the costs are much more complicated and so it's not self-sustainable. But we then we, we developed Verbein. Verbein is a social business. So it's a business that has to make profit. And we, we, we are in our third round of investment that uh, constituting the, the full uh, journey of the eye care. So I screen the people in a large scale using AI and different technologies and provide eye care in a cheap price, but still profitable. And make the from the screening, the eye care, even the surgeries. And if the person needs the, we sell the eyeglasses. And is it much more cheaper? We are 30%, 40% cheaper, actually 30, 40% of the price, not cheaper. So 60% cheaper than the current solutions in Brazil because our process uh, integrates a lot of technology, a lot of uh, procedure, uh, operational stuff that makes our much more efficient than what we, that's done in the, in the country. So last year, I traveled 113 flights. So I traveled all over the world to seek what's the most promising technology in eye care in the world. So we brought a lot of these technologies to Brazil and we make part of it. So we, we made the costs in the side of the screening and the eye exams much more cheap much cheaper actually than the so this now so we received the two rounds of investment and now we are we are scaling it's, it's documents sites of a series a uh, operation system amazing thank you so much for sharing all this with us uh continue with the our fireside chat uh, I can imagine that you have uh, had to overcome various obstacles to achieve all this impact so you talked a lot about operational. Uh, what were the main executional challenges that you have over your journey? And how did you make it through? Okay, so being an entrepreneur in Brazil is very difficult. So we have a, a very complicated tax system. So it's really very complicated. Uh, it, it says in the... Uh, I don't know what the research, but I think from the Economic World Forum that we, Brazilians have more uh, time spending in making their taxes from uh, that compared to anywhere in the world. So I have a team of three people today only to deal with the tax system. So it's quite bizarre, full-time employees. So entrepreneur in Brazil is very bureaucratic. So being a social entrepreneur is much more because like uh, we have a, when we started six, year, six years ago, the, the economic system was much more or less developed, uh, the social entrepreneur system. Now we, we have much more funds in the market, but in the beginning, no. And of course we have several obstacles. So I deal with eye care. So we have doc, we, we don't have optometry. So we, I have to deal with doctors. It's a very uh, conservative system. So we also have funds issues. We had in the, in the past funds issues. So for example, last year, we, rec we were receiving international fund funded uh, funds that we were able to raise. And it took six months to, to arrive the money because of the bureaucratic system in Brazil. So, and I actually paid, picked my credit card and passed the, uh, it's paid it twice. And I made a, a loan under my name to be able to run the system. So, cause I, it was very bureaucratic. So it's much more like uh, entrepreneur in Brazil, but like I feel, but it's not a, actually I, I say I criticize, but it's the game is for everyone. So for, my competitors had the same problem, so we have to deal with the uh, face with this, and it's uh, of course also an ocean of opportunities. So imagine that I have seventy one percent of the cities in Brazil without eye doctor, so I have a play a very huge market um, to go and to let's say explore in some case not only explore but also to make impact 
Right. So one question that everyone kept asking me these last few weeks since we started uh, marketing this talk is about your recognition by the UN. So amazing. Congratulations for for this big recognition. But we are very curious to know what exactly means to be an SDG young leader, how we can have this job as well. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, the SDG young leader is a, a prize, a recognition for people under the age of 29. So I actually turned 29 last month. So I, it, uh, it's under the age of 30, sorry, so I'm 29. Uh, that are actually working on the field to change the SDGs. So it's not something theoretical, it's the people that are actually making real impact. So I, it was around 7,000 7, people all over the world that uh, applied to this. And we have to show your actual results and send documents to prove it. And it was a very long process. And we already have reached 150,000 people. So for me, as a in kind of a, a young social entrepreneur, as 29 years old, I think it's a great result. Uh, and I think they like the because we have a very efficient system that uh, has a capability to scale very quickly. So now with this uh, this Series A investment, and also we have a lot of uh, we are starting to work with the government. I mean, Brazil now the federal capital of Brazil. So we in the next two three years, I think our numbers will increase at least by ten. So we uh, we have the capacity to scale, and also but this is a is a is a, a prize a recognition to help to reach the SDGs. Né? So we are in 2020, the, SDG, the goals are for 2030. So we have a decade now, so we have 10 years. So we don't have more time to, to plan, to think, we have to execute. Uh, so one of the main missions of the young leader is to inspire other people with their work to execute. So I do a lot of uh, speeches, lectures in Brazil. I, do, I did already three TED events in Brazil also. So we have today in Brazil, the biggest uh, young population in our history. So we have 15, 50, 50 million people between the age of 14 to 29. So my goal today is to inspire more young people, not to wait for the government to do something, but they, in, our, in their small community, their village, their city, or even a national scale, to put the hands on the field and try to make something to change the, the, their reality. So I think my capacity to inspire in some way and also the work that we do was the, why they selected me one of the seven teams, the only Brazilian by uh, around in this 8,000 people pool. So I think I'm very honored to this. So I think that and it's helping us a lot of visibility and all the, the results. Yes, no, that's amazing. Congratulations once again. And just another curiosity, how's the relationship between the, all the, the young leaders? How do you share information? Uh, do you have uh, frequent meetings? How can we each other be inspired? Today, uh, unfortunately, uh, normally in the, it's a two year process. So when we are elected, we go to the uh, UN assembly it was supposed to be in New York, but this year didn't happen because of the pandemic. So we had some virtual meetings so to know each other. And now uh, UN promised us that if we have a, a better situation, we will meet up everyone on April. So I think this will help us to interact more, to see how our works can be more uh, together, can help more people and integrate themselves. But today we are still in the beginning of the process to know each other. It, and now in a virtual system. Perfect. And I think uh, we have also. Yeah, we have, we have some more questions. questions I think. Yeah, but we will have uh, um, a session uh, the last couple of minutes to ah, discuss uh, the questions from the Q&A. So now, actually, I would like to invite Olivia uh, to join our conversation. Olivia, she's a representative of the INSEAD Masters in Management program, and she has a couple of questions to make uh, to you. Please, Olivia. Thanks, Vivian. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ralph. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Olivia. I'm a MIM student here at INSEAD. And for those who don't know what the MIM is, it's the new Masters in Management program which would be like a launchpad for a business international career. 
and most of us memes don't have you know, much work experience or were recently graduated from college. And so in that sense, um, my question to you, Ralph, uh, my first question is, what was your process or what's the story behind your decision to become a social entrepreneur right after graduating from university, from business school, um, instead of following a more traditional career path? Okay, so it was a very difficult decision, to be honest. So I was actually gra uh, graduating the three best schools in Brazil with a very strong curriculum. So I received several proposals from big companies, from law firms, from consultings. And it, I think it was a process because I was working with Renovacio. I saw my first two, the first two years of Renovacio was an undergrad student. So I was in, uh, still in school. So our first 12,000 classes in 15 states, our first bus, was building while I was, I was a student at, at INSPIR. So, and I was uh, graduating with a very strong degree. So, and every, I, I always uh, say that everyone was asking me, okay, it's very nice what, to do, what you do, it's very beautiful, but when you are going to a real work. So, and I always thought I, I, was, I needed to go to a real work. And I say that three uh, moments, uh, it was around 2015 that I made this, this decision and three very strong moments motivated me to change my mind. So I started to apply to very different uh, uh, multinational uh, works, the startups, and uh, I received proposal from uh, the, the uh, consulting firms to go to a traditional job. And people were actually making a very financial good work because I, uh, my curriculum was very strong for Brazilian. And the first one I was in a leadership course from Estudar Foundation, which is the Lehman, which is the, the most uh, foundation for a young uh, uh, leaders, I was one of the 30 of the supported by them. And when I presented myself, I say, I do this work in Renovacio, but I'm applying for other jobs. And the person asked me, why you are justifying yourself for making social impact? And actually, I saw that I was actually just, I always justified myself for making social impact. I was not proud of my work, even if I was already impacted at that time, 15,000 people. And then uh, it was, this was in December of 2015. Then in January, I lost an ex-girlfriend for cancer. So it was a very uh, fast process. And with a 22 years old, her life ended. And this made, and to, took me to a very reflexive system to what I wanted for my life. So while I was in Innsbruck, I founded uh, the Entrepreneur League. So I had mentorship with Lemons, all the biggest uh, names in, the, in Brazil. And actually, I was going to a traditional job because people I was wanted me to do, and not because what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I uh, say I want to live the life that the others wanted me to live, or the life that I, I really like going to the our work. And then three months later, Martin, which invented the tech, our one dollar glasses, came to Brazil. I went back to the Amazon. And I see my impact. In, uh, so Susanna's story, this video was in, in the, during this outreach. And I saw Talia. And I see how my impact can really change people's life. I said, I cannot go for a normal job and leave this behind. So in the beginning, I was a very decision. I will make this uh, a big organization. It started as a, a nonprofit. And Renovacio today is a nonprofit. And then uh, it, was, it got the opportunity to be to also to have Urbane as a, as a social business today for profit organization and looking behind to make a lot of sense. But the process in the beginning was very critical to decide because uh, I, I received a lot of pressure from my parents because I was I was graduating the best schools in the country. Why you don't get the, this amazing job and be stable for the rest of the, your life? And then I, we decided to entrepreneur in a, in, a, in a social area. So it was a very difficult moment, but I think today looking behind was no, I think, no, I'm sure that was the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Today for my parents agree. Sorry? And today my parents agree. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it was a be the best decision. Um, thank you so much. Um, well, so for my second question uh, that has to do with, with what you said, um, what would be a piece of advice that you have for people who, like you, wanna 
want to have an want to make an impact early on in their careers i think uh, just start uh, we need uh, good projects with good people so i think when six years ago the the, this, the social business system which more, were more much more less uh, developed but now today we have a lot of funds for social business for uh, the social area uh, and in brazil i think but what we lack today is great entrepreneurs with great ideas great projects that can be sustainable so if you have this and you want to do funds won't to be very very honest funds won't be a problem you need good people a great team that really have a purpose and actually a good solution to change some reality so if you can pack this you will be able to find supporters to start and start test test go to the field and test i started when i was doing three graduation at the same uh, three undergrad at the same time while i was in school and it worked so start and test like we are young and we have the right to have to make a mistake so this i think this is the best moment when i'm uh, maybe when i was if i was 40 i read with a career i read with kids i wouldn't take the decision to go for a new entrepreneurship but today i have much less risky because i don't have a now i have my fiance but like when i started i was a, in the school uh a young people the risk was much lower than to try make a mistake if it doesn't work okay i can go back to the traditional market because no i i have a, a great background and everyone in this this webinar have an amazing background in sad so go and do it just do it does nike sorry for the spo nike sponsor <laughs> no thank you it takes the pressure off vivian i think you are muted yes you are still muted <laughs> I think while uh, Vivian is uh, working in the her sound, I can tackle the questions in the Q and A. Uh, now I got it back. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I was having some technical issues, but it was first to thank Olivia for your contribution to our session, and also to go to the Q and A part. So we have people from all over the world here with us in the session, and we want to hear from them. We already collected some of uh, the questions beforehand, but I think it would be great to start uh, with uh, our other guests tonight. So I think maybe we can start with Colin's question because you started uh, talking about funds uh, before. So regarding raising funds, how do investors perceive the business and are they mostly NGOs? Okay, so we have today, as I told, two organization. So we have uh, Renovat with, with an NGO. So in the NGO, we mostly receive funds from companies. So, and also families and individuals. So, but it's donation, it's not investment. So they, they donate the money so we can make our impact. So we have Unilever, we have Bank of America, Santander, Luxitani as the most famous in worldwide, but have a lot of big companies in Brazil, have United Health Group, AT&T Foundation, but mostly of them are not NGOs or foundation, they are actual, actual companies that want, and normally they want us to do our impact in some region that makes sense to them. Uh, and now 30% of the Renovatios uh, philanthropic money comes from our one for one model, one for 14 model that we have in our business. So this is donation. When we go to Verbain, which is a business, we are, we, today we have uh, six investors, eight investors, and they are mostly uh, wealthy families that actually seeks the impact, but to, uh, also with the profit. So we have the Lemons uh, family, which is the owner of uh, Heinz, Burger King, uh, the most rich family in Brazil. We have Piponzi families, which is the family that owns the, a very big pharmacy chain, the biggest uh, pharmacy chain in Latin America. They have 2,000 pharmacies all over the country. So we have uh, eight uh, wealthy families that supported us to make a, a business. So it's a, they, they, it seeks profit, but also a very great impact in the eye care system. So we already made two rounds of investment and now we are going to our series A. So we are finishing the, the final uh, funds, but like we, we already re uh, reached a very good valuation with a very great amount of investment now. 
So there is two separate way of funding the, the operation, the philanthropic part in on one side and the business in the other one. Yeah, uh, you're always still muted. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why every time I mute myself, I cannot unmute, so then I'm going to speak more. Uh, so we have also in the Q&A, we have two questions regarding uh, the global market and the international exposure. So one of them, uh, I will start with Maria's. Uh, so do you work with international organizations to get some support and how the UN can help you with some resources that are not necessarily financial? Okay, uh, today we are working with, uh, we, we, our only international funds comes from some foundations, like so we have at and Foundation, we have a big fund of United Health Group in the US, and also one of our best globally support our philanthropic work also, using funds that they collect from Europe. And now we, are st we hired a team uh, to, to seek international funds, because now we have data, so in the last two years, all our outreaches were, we have scientific studies about the impact, about the results, the KPIs. So we made, we collect a lot of data of our activities because the most international organization, the international foundations, we, we need to justify our impact by the cost of impact. So in the last two years, we made a lot of uh, studies that uh, showed the real impact of our work. We, we actually, some of these studies were, even we received international awards the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And now we are ready to seek for international funds because we have data. So to be very, very honest, most of the, when you go to a normal company, they want us to go to a, a, an area. It's not, it's not, it's more decision because if they connect with their business, then based on data of impact. But now when you go to international foundations, the data is much more important. So now we are ready to do so. And we are just started our one, one of our team to work on this area. And, and the other one for, from Ankit, uh, what are some of the competition competitors in this market globally? And how is your organization different given the last mile social okay. business for eye care that it's becoming very popular in Asia and Africa? Okay, so we have to, uh, if you compare to a global scenario, we have to uh, split the system because all around the world, except for Brazil, we have the glasses system that's optometrist, refraction, and eyeglasses. And then we have the eye care system that's eye doctor that takes care of cataract, retina, and the, the diseases. In Brazil, we don't have the separation because we don't have optometrists. So we can I, I cannot go, I cannot go as for example, other players in Asia that goes in the last mile, go to a, a house, make the refraction in the with an optometrist and sell the eyeglasses. Is not allowed in Brazil by system. So today we integrate the full health system, have a, a platform that I screen in scale uh, using AI and, and transmit this to our eye doctor. So uh, if the eye doctor receive even the pathologist, get the cataract, the system, and also the refraction. Uh, so it's a much more integrated system that is not, uh, it, makes, it, not it makes less sense yeah, I can replicate in some, uh, if I adapt to uh, on a global scale, mostly because of the, the screening using technology, but it's much different because the realities in Brazil are completely different because we have to integrate the system using the eye care and the uh, eyeglasses system, let's say like that. So it's not comparable at all, but I think that the solution is scalable, global, uh, it can, I can scale globally, integrate, but like today, the social business for eyeglasses, they are completely focused only on the eyeglasses. Today we are focused the full eye. So I think we say that we are the angels of the eye of the person. Mm -hmm. So I pick the, the problem and then I develop the full solution. If it's an eyeglass, it's okay. Or if it's a surgery, also okay. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for sharing the live uh, questions. We also received some questions this week, and I think we have time for one or two more. So you talked a lot about how hard it was your decision. And we know that working with social impact generally pay less than the other industries. And here we have a lot of 20Ds uh, almost ready to graduate and trying to make uh, this decision on what to do next. 
here at INSEAD uh, to encourage our students to pursue a career in the public, non-for-profit sectors, for-profit social ventures and social invest firms, there is a low one of assistant awards uh, to uh, incentivize um, our students to pursue those careers. So given this context, how do you deal with the compensation and talent acquisition in your business? Okay, so this is something that we, we, we are very, in the beginning in Brazil, we are very different. So I always say to my team, and today we have 40, uh, 40 full-time employees uh, that get money from our work, that love doesn't pay the bills. So when I have to hire someone, I don't hire people that I want, I have a, I want to change the world or I want to work. I have, I have a very strong mission so is to change a, a full uh, eye care system in the country. So I have to address 40 million people. So it's a very big dream, a very difficult one. So I need the best people. So my financial, my CFO, I pick him up from Ambev, which is a very big company in Brazil. My marketing guy, I picked from a big advertising agents because in my opinion, if I work for the, it's not, it's not a, a fair that a person works for a cigarette, cigarette company or a, a, a normal company and gets a very good salary. And why the person cannot work for changing the world and have the same salary. So we, we, well, we always try to, to bring the best people that to, to solve the problem that we're facing the moment. And then when the person gives the first of the, his first eyeglass, uh, eyeglasses, he get the love with, uh, with uh, the purpose of our mission and they, they work even more. So we always try to seek the best people uh, to work with us. And is it possible today? I think all the, the very, the, the future business will be somehow social business to address the, the realities or a, a problem of access or something. So, uh, and this business have to be self-sustainable and be able to pay normal salaries or even, I, in my opinion, a person that's changing the world needs to receive more money than someone that's not changing the world. Mm -hmm. So I, it's a, I think that there's a very nice TED talk from Dan Palotta that um, is something around like, why we are doing charity that wrong. So I really uh, ask if you want to see and to talk about salaries and incentives in the social area. But I really think that people have to receive very good uh, normal salaries so they, they are happy with their own stuff and their uh, own background so they can focus on doing the best and the purpose adds to this to this solution and they potentialize them even, even more. So I don't Amazing. know if I asked how no, you, you Thank you so much for sharing the, your view with us. It's also what I believe. So uh, thank you very much. And I think we have uh, time for a Quick last question. So what do you think it's needed in order for the private sector to get more involved with social impact initiatives? And in a nutshell, how do you see business for good being good for business? Okay, so the first question about the private business, I think the, they are actually, the, the system is developing uh, very quickly. And I think really the pandemic helped a lot. So I never saw in Brazil, for example, in, during the pandemic, the, all the organizations made a lot of donations and investing because they saw that like, uh, if they don't solve the problem, then they only wait for the government, all their business will be affected because they have lockdowns, they start, they start they stop at selling. So, and they made a lot of philanthropic investments. So it was the biggest uh, all time donations uh, during this, the pandemic from like compared to any year. So like Itaú, for example, which is a bank, donated 1 billion reais. So Haya Brazil is the pharmacy company that I told about, but it's 200 million. So there are, it was numbers that we never saw before in the philanthropic sector in, in our country. And I can say this even globally. So the cent from China to date almost uh, $1 billion, something like that. So it's quite bizarre, bizarre numbers to help. So I think the pandemic actually shocked a bit that we need to have something that's more only, not only focused for the business, but also to change the world. And coming back for the, the second question, what, how is being good for business? Uh, business for good is good for business. Yeah. I really think that business for the future that will look for the, the customer that I need, it, it's an open market. So it's a blue ocean that are people, for example, in Africa and in Asia, even in Brazil that are unattended. So like it's billions of people that needs to be uh, included in the market. 
Yeah. So it is what we are doing. So no one in the eye care sector in Brazil are looking for the 71% of the cities that don't have any eye care. So we are building solutions to help to help these people because they they have access. Yeah. And of course, it's it, it it will bring money because like it's a full a blue ocean of people that are no one looks because their yeah. the eye care system in Brazil is very they generate a lot of money. The margins are great, so they don't need to go out of the capital. But we have like 70% of the people waiting, so we are looking to them and not not facing competitions in the in the main cities and addressing helping people and of course make a profitable business of this. So it's a this is the meaning of social business. So we have a a huge market unattended until today, globally speaking. Thank you, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. But unfortunately, we are getting towards the end of our session. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to Hauf, to Olivia, and to everyone that attended this very inspirational talk. Hope everyone will leave here uh, doing good. Uh, I also want to thank the Latin Club and my co-president Francisco for helping me to organize this event and to Accenture Strategy for partnering with us on the 2020 SDG week. Every session uh, was recorded and will be available in our website uh, soon. Uh, and I would also want to have like, oh, so stay connected with us. We are gonna um, make the recording available. And also be before I end, I want to do a big shout out to the Operation and Hoffman Institute team. They worked magic in the background to deliver a successful SDG week. And while this week of events is over, we still have a number of events coming up. So please take a look on them, register, and don't forget to join the community Impact Challenging. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Half. Thank you, Olivia. And um, we stay connected and stay healthy. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Greetings for Brazil and stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe.